Hello everyone, I'm Nathaniel along with Adnan to present our attack and defense presentation titled Malicious Code in Websites. We'll cover four attacks for this presentation including SQL injection, cross-site scripting attacks, cross-site request forgery attacks, and cross-site scripting wars. For each attack we'll cover the history, how to implement them, a demo to show them in action using our own social networking site as a test bed, and the proper defense against these attacks. Then we'll end with broader issues and themes to take away for these texts. So first we'll cover SQL injection. The first occurrence of SQL injection was mentioned in the Ferric magazine that described a vulnerability in Microsoft SQL Server, the same vulnerability that still applies today. For a SQL injection, you simply input or inject SQL inquiries from the client side. Depending on the implementation of the backend, this would allow attackers to read sensitive data or at worst, allow privileged access and writability to the database. The key to the attack is recognizing that the website does not sanitize user input. Here we see that in the server backend, it simply takes the username and password at face value. However, if you pass in a statement that is always true, such as one equals one, then when the SQL query is passed into the database, it will always return an entry. In our case, if the user succeeds this query, then they're given access to the corresponding account. So here on our left, we have the actual website that we're going to exploit using SQL injection. Um, and on the right, we have the actual server running on Node.js. So we can log in normally using ASDF and QWERTY as our username and password. We're presented with John Doe, which just has our, um, his name and then occupation as a graduate student associated with the free Tech. Um, other than that, all the links are dead. Um, but then going back to the login page, um, we can try to exploit this using um, SQL injection. So we'll start with a quotation mark, which ends the, the query for the username. And then we'll pair it with an or statement such that if one equals, equals one, um, that's gonna return true. So do that for username and password. And then we'll see, we got John Doe's profile here. And that's how you do SQL injection. So with SQL injection in mind, how can we protect ourselves against it? Um, some key defenses are outlined in the OWASP prevention cheat sheet, um, and they include the use of prepared statements with parameterized queries, use of stored procedures, whitelisting input validation, and if that doesn't work, escaping all user supplied input. So for this specific example I showed, uh, we simply use prepared statements to fix this. So instead of directly inputting our data, the username and password are passed into this prepared statement and treated as strictly as data, not as part of the code, preventing any further SQL queries to get more information. So to show that a defense against the SQL injection will be using prepared statements per with parameterized um, statements instead. So here we changed it such that the question marks are parameterized queries, passing in username and password. Call this server now fixed app.js. So let's try doing the exploit again. Yep, it fails. And that's how you protect yourself against SQL injection. Now let's talk about cross-site escaping. Microsoft security engineers introduced the term cross-site scripting in January 2000. Access attacks enable attackers to inject blindsided scripts into the web pages viewed by other users. Of all the securities documented by Semantic up until 2017, around 84% of them were accesses were cross-site scripting. So this is the most vulnerable attack uh, up until 2007. So how this works? So what happens is that a perpetrator discovers a website having a vulnerability that enables this script injection. And the perpetrator injects a website with malicious script that is steals each visitor's session cookies. And for each visit to the website of a normal user, his cookie is sent to the perpetrator now let's see a demo of the attack we just described. So here is a sample social networking website uh, and a news feed of that social networking website. So this website is malicious to access attack. So what happens is that an attacker called Diana inflicts this website with a malicious link and in the background, she's waiting uh, to get the session cookie of the user. So if a normal user 
click this link, what happens is that it's made to demo shares in the website. So the user thinks nothing happened and it was a fluke and fun. But in the background, the attacker gets the session to go of the user and he can or she can use it for any bad purposes that he or she wants. Now we fix this attack by uh, treating the search in user input as uh, text content. So we don't uh, allow other users to put malicious script in our website or to run malicious script. So what happens is that if for the same script, we click it right now, as we have fixed it, and the search item is uh, treated at, as text. The malicious script will be shown as search and it will do nothing harmful. Other difference in technique would involve safely validating untrusted HTML input. Now let's talk about uh, cross-site request forgery or CSRF. So CSRF vulnerabilities have been known and in some cases exploited since 2001. One of the most common scenarios was the Netscape website in 2006. So it has numerous vulnerabilities to CSRF, which could have allowed an attacker to perform actions such as adding a DVD, the victim's rental queue, changing the shipping address of the account, or altering the victim's login credentials to fully compromise the account. So let's see how does it work. So an attacker sent forged requests by phishing or any other technique to the victim. The victim mistakenly or un unwillingly uh, click that link and post something to the vulnerable website. So the web server validates it and the attacker gets whatever he or she wants. Now let's see a demo of the attack we just described. So here is the website, which is called the Vulnerable Movie Center. So here any user can review, submit reviews to uh, a movie. So here we have logged into the user's account which is named Alice, and here is Alice's email. So, and here are some reviews that Alice posted. So what happens is that uh, when Alice is logged in the website and if Alice goes to a vulnerable website called the attacker website and he, sees, he or she sees nothing fishy, it is a normal website, but often, what happens is that this website was malicious and it, uh, in the background, it posted uh, CSRF requests to the Vulnerable Movie Center website and it changed credentials of Alice. So right now his credential has been changed and all of the comments or reviews posted by Alice previously is named from that hacker. Now we fix this by uh, validating CSRF token. So a CSRF token is a value proving that you are sending a request from a, from or a link generated by the server. In other words, when the server sends a from to the client, it attaches a unique random value, the CSRF token, so that the clients need to send back. So when we go to uh, the attacker's website right now, the manager's website, what happens is that nothing happens here. The profile stays the same. It was, it was before. And for our last attack, we'll cover cross-site scripting worms. A worm is a specific cross-site scripting attack such that it also affects people who view the victim's profile as well. The first mention was a cross-site vulnerability in Hotmail back in 2002. However, the most famous use was Sammy Kamkar on 2005 MySpace. His worm made users add him as a friend and claim him to be their hero on their profile, just because the user stumbled upon Sammy's profile. It got so bad that it affected roughly 1 million users at its peak and Sammy was convicted for a felony charge. Sammy was able to run his exploit due to the fact that a user could input HTML tags into their profiles. He used a hidden div tag that ran his code and I simply use a script tag as you will see in the demo later. Sammy also was aware of how MySpace forms their endpoints and formed user IDs. I tried to mirror that in the exploit, but if you want a more detailed look, he has a blog post and relevant code snippets that explain the exploit specifics in MySpace. So now we'll demonstrate how to exploit using the cross-site scripting worm. Here we have three users now. We have Sammy, we have John again, and we have Alice. 
Let's log into Sammy's account. His credentials are Elite Hacker. Now we can see that we can look at members, add friends, other members here. There's John's profile. Um, now we go back to Sammy. But most importantly, um, we can now edit our profile using whatever tags that we want. So Sammy, knowing the various endpoints and other people's like um, credentials using noticing because the username is up, up there, um, we'll first try to change the occupation such that Whenever somebody visits its page, we can see that he's adding, forcing the person to add him as a friend there. And next, um, nested inside that script, um, specifically knowing John's um, username based on visiting his profile, uh, we can force John to have his profile being updated to also have that same um, script added there too. So let's update this account. It looks normal, it's about the same. Um, but if we go to um, John's account now, we'll see that he has a changed value now. So now let's log into um, John's account. He, he changed his password to average guy now. Um, so going to John um, and going to Sammy's profile, well, what's this? The number of friends is now up incremented to one. So it shows that the script works. So if we now move on to another unsuspecting user, let's say Alice, whose credentials are Queen Hearts. Um, if we go actually to visit John's page, um, we would, and then go over to see, check on um, Sammy's page, we actually have two friends now because we visited John's page, um, which added um, Alice as a friend to Sammy. And that's how you exploit using cross-site scripting worm. Regarding defenses, since the worm is just another form of cross-site scripting, the defenses that add non detail in the section also apply here. So specifically, instead of allowing for string interpolation and letting the user input those types of tags, I simply remove that option and force the input to be displayed in plain text. On the left with dynamic bug is the exploitable version, while the right, the fixed dynamic bug is the plain text normal version. So to show that the um, changing that this string interpolation, um, turning that off specifically fixes this problem, we'll try to update the profile again. And then absolute garbage is seen here, but at least um, the user can no longer exploit the system as such. So that's how you protect against a cross-site scripting worm. So to wrap it all up, we cover four attacks, um, their history, how to implement them, and even how to defend against them. And each of them have a high potential to damage websites and online services. In fact, those listed are a part of OWASP's top 10 vulnerabilities list and yet have persisted for almost two decades. The most common defenses against them use up-to-date data security features such as SQL prepare statements. We also saw that they, by simply performing routine checks and ensuring the information passed by the user cannot impact the system, we can prevent these vulnerabilities from happening. Practicing defensive programming is a key to making a small mistake becoming a production nightmare. On the flip side, as an attacker, we should also report every small detail. Most of these attacks were born from simple queries online, so experimenting and intentionally breaking systems could lead to a valuable exploit.